Praise the Lord. Luke chapter 11. I'm going to pray and then we're going to jump into the Word of God. The title of tonight's message is Filled with the Spirit. Filled with the Spirit. Now, we've been going over a series about filling the house. And uh, we, we started with fill the house. And then the next one, we talked about being filled with the truth. And tonight, we're going to talk about being filled with the Spirit. So I'm going to pray. And then we're going to start in our scriptures here in Luke chapter 11. So Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity for us to gather together in your name. Lord, I thank you that you have a word for us, a word that will uh, examine our hearts, Lord, a, a word that will pull deceit away from our eyes, a word that will breathe life on the truth and cause us to live on the inside. Father, I pray that your word, which is truth, would lead us into reality. Father, that we would receive from you everything that you have for us, everything that you want to give us tonight. And as we receive the word of God, Father, I pray that our lives would be changed. Lord, we don't come to hear a talk. We come to hear the voice of the Lord speaking through people. And so, Father, let your word speak to our hearts. Let your voice uh, uh, be loud in our souls tonight. Lord, as we gather together in your name, we honor you and bless you. And we thank you, Jesus, for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. So Luke chapter 11, verse 24 through 26. Now, this is the same passage we've been starting in the last three weeks. And I'm just going to narrow it down. And this is Jesus speaking. He says, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finding none. He says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So here we have Jesus, and Jesus is teaching, just for context, Jesus is teaching right after he delivers somebody from demonic oppression. There was a boy that was mute or a man that was mute that, that couldn't speak. Jesus cast the devil out of him. And the man could speak. And then the people were like, show me, test. They were testing Jesus. They were like, prove it that you're from God. And then Jesus starts talking about binding the strong man, casting him out. And then when a demon goes out, uh, it leaves the house and it goes around. And then after a while, it gets bored and comes back. And then uh, if it finds the house empty, then it brings seven more demons worse. And so Jesus is actually emphasizing the fact that we want to fill the house. We want to fill our house after God has evicted demonic and evil and sin and all that stuff. God has pushed that stuff out and made us clean. Jesus is emphasizing we need to fill our house. We can't, we can't just get clean and stay empty. We have to get clean from the power of God, and then we have to be filled with something else. So after a while, we know he said the spirit gets ejected, it goes out, and then it's going to come to see if there's a way back in. And this is what I want you to get. Jesus was talking about something that the devil is doing, something that we have to be actively engaged against. We can't be passive when it comes to uh, living a spiritual life. And he's saying this strategy of the enemy, and we can see this strategy of the enemy. How many of y'all remember uh, it, when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness? Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit and he was driven to the wilderness. You remember that? And when Jesus was driven in the wilderness, what happened? The devil tested him three times, right? And after, and, and y'all tell me in the chat, how did, how did Jesus respond? He responded with the word. Y'all could do it in the room too, but he responded with the word. The devil said something and what did Jesus do? Jesus responded, it is written. And then at the end of that little section there, in Luke chapter four, verse 13, the Bible says the devil went away until uh, he stopped his testing until an opportune time. He went away until opportunity presented itself. He was waiting. He stepped back and said, okay, I can't beat Jesus today. I'm going to wait for the right moment and then I'm going to strike again. And you guys know that that's exactly the way the devil comes at us. God gives us a victory in our lives. And when God gives us a victory in our lives, the devil goes away and he says, okay, I'm going to wait to strike again. I want to tell you something that I learned as a uh, in infantry school in the Marine Corps. And it's something called a hasty defense. When you would do something we would call squad rushes where your team would assault through an objective and you would take the take this location away from an enemy and you would battle your way up and you would take this ground, you did something very critical right away. And it was called set up a hasty defense. In other words, you didn't, you didn't rest, you didn't relax, you automatically extended yourself out and set up a defensive perimeter and you began to check out your casualties, you checked out your bullets, you checked out your band-aids, you, you just basically were taking the stock of things. 
Because here's the truth. When you win a battle, when you go through a battle, when you're expending your energy, when you're, 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 win, you're pressing to win, what happens is, is you are using up resources and now you become vulnerable. The moment after a victory, the moment after God moves in your life, the devil knows that you are vulnerable. The devil is going to try to immediately turn around and test to see if you're going to give in or you're going to continue to stand firm on your victory. Now, many of us have experienced this. You know, we, we have been delivered by God. We've, we've experienced victory. How many of y'all have prayed for something? Oh, God, deliver me from this thing. And God touches you and God blesses you. And for a moment, it seems like you're free. See, here's the thing. The devil steps back and says, okay, I'm going to wait for another opportunity. When you're tired, when you're angry, when you're lonely, when you're hungry, y'all know the halt principle, right? You never want to be too hungry, too angry, too lonely, or too tired because when you're one of those things or more of those things, you become extremely vulnerable to uh, especially emotional manipulation and attack. And that's what the devil does. He says, okay, God set you free. I can't touch you right now, but I'm going to wait till you let down your guard. And once you let down your guard, I'm coming back at you. So we want to live life, not passively. We don't want to say, oh God, you saved me. You thank, I thank you for that. You bless me. I'm so happy. And then just sit back as if we don't have to do anything else after that. The Bible challenges us. The Bible tells us you're not a slave anymore. You're not a prisoner to the flesh anymore. Now you are uh, the called, the chosen, the redeemed. You are invited to participate in the mission of Jesus. That means you have to step forward and start moving. That means you got to start living offensively or having an aggressive mentality. Right? John said it this way. He said, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. See, what we don't want to do is we don't want to be the kind of people that, that come to church, get a touch from God, and go away uh, uh, as if nothing, we don't have to do anything else ever again. We don't want to be the kind of people who just sit back on what God did for us instead of pressing in to what God wants to do through us. See, God's not just interested in in, in blessing you and leaving you that way. God is interested in blessing you, working inside of you and turning you loose to carry that same kingdom authority and that king, same kingdom power uh, to, to turn that loose into the world. You have to remember that the gates of hell won't prevail against the church. It won't prevail against the revelation of Jesus. It won't prevail against the follower of God who knows that Jesus is the son of God, who Jesus has come and he died and he rose again and he gives us his Holy Spirit. We're not victims anymore. Now we're overcomers. And, and this is the truth that we can't sit back. See, gates are defensive mechanisms. They just sit there. But Jesus talking about the gates, he's saying the gates of hell, they keep things out or they might keep things in. But he's saying these gates can't stop the church. So what does that tell you? That tells you that Jesus's mindset for us is a forward mindset, not a passive one. We're not sitting back. We're not resting and waiting. We are moving forward with the plan and purposes of God. When we fill our lives with truth, when we fill our lives with reality, remember we talked about that last week, that truth is that which corresponds to reality. So when we fill our lives with truth, we become way less of a target of opportunity for the devil. So here's point number one, and maybe in the chat somebody can write this down. Point number one, Jesus was filled with the Spirit, and you should be too. Point number one, Jesus was filled with the Spirit, and you should be too. In Luke chapter four, and I alluded to this earlier, Luke chapter four, verses one and two, it says, then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days, he ate nothing. And afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. So Jesus is our prototype. The Bible calls him the firstborn among many brethren, right? He's the first. He's the example on how how we were meant to truly live. God created us to function in such a way. God knows how we're supposed to operate. You know, it's like this phone. Who tells me how, to, how, how this phone is supposed to function? I don't, you don't see it back here, but there's an Apple on there, right? This is an iPhone. So, so Apple tells me the best way for this phone to function. They know what the details they, they put in there. They know the features. They know the design. They know how that thing is supposed to work. So they're the experts on how to use this phone, aren't they? Now, now who's the expert on how, how to live life? It might just be the creator of life, right? The God who created you might know the conditions on which you are meant to operate so that you can have an optimal experience. 
Jesus came to show us that in the flesh. And if Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit, how much more do we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit? If Jesus spent his, his active ministry days on the earth, how much more do we need the Holy Spirit? The Bible says he was filled with the Spirit of God, and it was important. Matter of fact, it was so important to Jesus that we be filled with the Holy Spirit. Remember he told his disciples before they, they went on mission? He said, y'all don't leave Jerusalem until you receive the Holy Spirit. Y'all don't even try to do what I've called you to do until you get what I got to give you. If you don't stick around and get this Holy Spirit, you are going to miss out on opportunities, on power, on truth, on things that you need to be successful in life. See, the Holy Spirit filled Jesus, and then he led Jesus according to the will of God. Now, I want to tell you the truth. The world, the flesh, and the devil, they want to lead you too. They want to influence you. They, they, these, are, these are forces that work to manipulate us, to move us, right? They, they, they want to, to make us uh, submitted to their vision of reality. This is, this is what their goal are. This is what their desire is. It's to, to bend us into their plan, their will, their, their purpose for our lives. And instead, the Bible tells us that children of God are led by the Spirit of God. See, God has a plan for you. God has a desire for you. God has a purpose for your life. And you have to be filled with the Holy Spirit and led by the Spirit so that you can experience that perfect will. This is where a lot of Christians get it wrong is because we don't emphasize enough the, the Holy Spirit part, the power of God, the, the residence of the Spirit of God on the inside of us because I don't wake up every day thinking I need the Holy Spirit so I can live out my purpose, so I can function in peace, so I can be a part of the kingdom of heaven today. Because I don't live with a conscious awareness of that, I start doing things in my own strength. And when I start doing things in my own strength, I only get what my capacity can give me. Now, y'all are good. There are things that you're really good at, and there are things that you're really not good at. But all of us are limited in our capacity. The Holy Spirit is unlimited in his ability. So when I learn to be filled with the Spirit, what I'm learning is to be put in a position where I have access to the grace of God and the power of God and the wisdom of God and the truth of God so that I can live the life that I was created to live. See, having the abiding presence of the Spirit of truth to lead us is a very powerful weapon against the things that want to wage war against our souls. Remember, Jesus said when the spirit of truth comes, he's going to lead you into all truth. And last week we talked about we have to be filled with truth. We have to be filled with truth, knowledge of the word of God, hearing God's voice and being filled with that reality, obeying that. But the filling of the Holy Spirit was not just about leading us into truth. It's not just about direction. How, how, many, how many of us here want to be led by God, want to know the direction that God has for our life? We all do, right? I mean, if you're, on, if you're online, just say, yeah, I, I want to be led by the Spirit, don't you? We all want to be led. We, know, we want direction. We want purpose. But the only one that knows that big picture and where you play into that big picture is God himself. The Spirit of God knows what your purpose is. He knows where you best thrive and where you best operate and what gifts that he's given you and what talents that you have so that he can plug you in to the right place. But it's not just leading and direction that the Holy Spirit offers us. The Holy Spirit gives us power. He gives us ability. Look at Matthew 12, 28. This was the same conversation. Listen to what Jesus is saying. He's saying, uh, Matthew 12, 28, but if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Notice the power to cast out the demons, the power to drive out the darkness, the power to overcome the evil was the Spirit of God. Now look at the next one, Acts 10, 38. The Bible says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good in healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him. See, we don't only need to be filled with truth. We definitely need to be filled with truth so the enemy doesn't gain a stronghold in our lives so that he doesn't lie to us and cause us to live in unreality, but we need to be filled with the Spirit so that we have power to live the life that God invites us to live. We need power. We're not able in our own strength. 
We're not able to conquer our flesh. We're not able to deal with demonic things. We're not able to even really deal with our boss's attitude, are we? I mean, sometimes human spirits are just enough, right? We, we, we need not only the truth of God, but we need the power of God. So here's my next point. You are God's house. You are God's house. 1 Corinthians 3.16. Now I'm going to read this from the Amplified Bible. 1 Corinthians 3.16 in the Amplified. It says, Do you not discern and understand that you, the whole church at Corinth, because Paul was writing to the church there, are God's temple, his sanctuary, and that God's spirit has his permanent dwelling in you to be at home in you collectively as a church and also individually. Collectively, the church and individually, the believer is the place where the Holy Spirit desires to dwell. The Holy Spirit wants to live in the church and in each individual Christian. You are God's house. The condition, and, and as a result, and I want you to, I'm going to pull out just a little, uh, we're going to go on a rabbit trail for just a second, so hang with me. But, but this tells us how important the individual is to the whole. See, my level of holiness has the ability to affect everybody in the church, doesn't it? And y'all get that. If the pastor's in sin, we got a problem, don't we? Right? But it's the same thing if someone in the last row is living in sin. Uh, that person has the same ability to influence the whole. Right? Think, think about it this way. If, if someone comes in the front door and they meet somebody really full of God's grace and full of God's goodness and really just wonderful, just, you know, just carrying that love of God. And they experience that at the front door, and then the greeters welcome, or then the ushers welcome them to their seat, and they experience that same presence of God. Then, and then they catch somebody over here who's kind of got a snarky attitude. What do you think that person's main overall impression is going to be? It's going to be generally good, but probably that snarkiness, they might say, I don't know. Now, if they come to the front door and their first experience is with someone bad, but then every other one is good the first thing that they're going to remember is that bad experience. This is how we are, uh, this is, there's a, there's a whole thing, there's a book, you can look this up, but it's called The Likeability Factor. You know, we tend to, if you like the first encounter, you're going to like that person usually no matter what. And they can do dumb things and they can make mistakes and you're still going to like them because you liked them from the beginning. If you didn't like them, then no matter how good they are, it's going to be really hard for them to overcome your initial your initial you know, impression. My point really is this, is that people say, oh, that church has a vibe, right? Uh, uh, that atmosphere. If, if the atmosphere is bad because the people, the atmosphere is either good or bad because of the people inside of it, right? And really what they're saying is this church is like Jesus or this church is not like Jesus, right? It affects, it affects. And the Bible is clear that not only does our relationship to God and our holiness and all that stuff affect the whole, but the Bible is really clear that God wants to live inside of you. God wants to make his home in you. But see, here's the thing. When God finds us, we're like that shack. I mean, anybody driven down like a country road where there's like this house, it's like an ancient house that like trees are growing up into and, 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 and you know, like there's ivy and there's all kinds of stuff just growing up into the tree and, and to the house and it's just dilapidated and it's just falling apart and it's just broken. And, and that's how God, that's how we are when God finds us. Now, I know you're more beautiful than that. You got your nice church clothes on. I'm, I'm glad you guys are here. And, and, you know, he's perfect right there. And, and online, you guys are just chilling, looking great at home, I'm sure. But, but here's the truth. When God found us, we were not a mansion. We were not a, a castle worthy of a king. So what God does, he finds us as a broken down, busted shack. And he says, I, I buy this place because this, this has potential. And what does he start doing? He starts cleaning out the trash, doesn't he? Right? You know, he goes in and just starts remodeling. We're going to tear down this wall. We're going to take out this trash. We're going to start cleaning this up. He gets it clean, but a shack, a clean shack is still not fit for a king, is it? So then what does he say? I need some space because I'm the king of the universe. So let's kick out this wall. And so what does God do? He deals with something in our lives and he kicks down a wall that's keeping us from being like him. And then God says, oh, I, wanna, I don't like this, uh, this paint job. I don't like this wallpaper here. So I start tearing things down. And y'all would say, I mean, how many of y'all have ever felt God tearing something down in your life, right? 
You thought, okay, I'm good to go. And then God shows you something bad. He said, let me show you what's happening behind this corner. It's kind of like one of those uh, home improvement shows where they're coming in and they're like, uh, it's, uh, there's a show I like. It's Love It or List It, right? And they're in Canada and they're, they're like, the one person's job is to remodel it so that they love it and stay. And the other guy's job is to find a better place. And one of the things that the, the lady does, and she's the, uh, the love it person, she, she comes in and she has a budget, but sometimes they'll uncover things. Her contractors will uncover things. And she's like, oh man, it's going to take like half of my budget now. How am I going to make them love it when we got to fix this mess? And that's exactly what God does in our lives. He's like, listen, I want to live here. I am remodeling this place because I love it. But what I got to do is I got to show you that right here, we're going to have to do some major reconstruction. Right here, we're going to have to tear this stuff out. This is a hindrance to the flow. See, God doesn't just clean the home. He remodels it. God doesn't, doesn't just come in your life and make you holy and save you and make you all right now. He wants to change you. He wants to transform you. He takes the trash, the sin, the junk, the wickedness out of the home, and he starts to fill your house with good things. Here's my next point. Staying filled means staying free. Staying filled means staying free. See, in light of these things, we need to stay filled with the Holy Spirit because God wants us to be free. God wants us to be full of the Spirit. Because of that, we want to stay filled with the Spirit so we can walk in the freedom which we were created. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 through 18, says this. It says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And then he says this, and do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the spirit. So the idea of this of this verse, the idea of this passage is control. It's about influence. It's about who or what is behind your behavior. We'll say that again. It's not about drinking. It's not about the spirits, about influence. It's about who is behind the way you respond. Who is who is the motivation or what is the driving force beyond your reactions and your actions? In the initial text, remember, all the way back in the beginning, Jesus was talking about life free from the demonic. He says, that spirit gets out of your life. Now you're clean. Now you're whole. Now you're out of the control and away from the influence of evil things. And this passage, the Apostle Paul contrasts being influenced under the, uh, by being under the influence of alcohol with being under the influence of the Spirit, right? Even when we drive, right? If you drive and you've been drinking, what do they say? You're under the influence. If you're high and you're driving, listen, ain't nobody in the church should be doing any of those things. Amen? But here's the thing. We come under the influence of those things. You can come under the influence of a substance or you can be overcome by anger, can't you? Right? How many times have we said something that later we regretted because we're under the influence of anger. And this is what Paul is saying. It's like there are, there's are, there are things that are working behind the scenes to move you, to pull you down, to overtake you, to bring you under their power, to manipulate you and influence you. And he says, don't submit to those things. Instead, submit to the Spirit's control in your life. Instead, be full of the Spirit so that He can move you, He can motivate you, He can influence you. See, before coming to Jesus, we weren't our own, were we? I mean, we were, we were influenced by deceptive ideas. And those deceptive ideas led to disordered desires. And those disordered desires created a sinful world. And, I, and, and I'm, I'm kind of using those phrases a little bit, uh, as John Mark Comer would say. He would say, basically, there, and, and I'm summarizing this, but basically this is lies from the devil manipulating our flesh, leading to a fallen world. Isn't that a good summary, a good assessment of what the way the, the world, the flesh, and the devil, work, the devil works against us? The lies... The, that's what temptation is. Remember, we talked about that last week. It's unreality. Temptation is painting a picture that's not true about what will make you happy. I'm tempted to do this because it's going to make me happy, except for it doesn't make you happy. And that, that desire gets twisted. And because it gets twisted, we behave wrongly. And because we behave wrongly, sin gets released in the world and people get hurt. But then Jesus comes. And he sets us free. 
See, God didn't set you free just to leave you under the power of the world, the flesh, and the devil. God didn't say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, it's kind of like a, um, a kid being bullied and then an adult coming in and breaking it up, but not staying with the kid. Because y'all know what happens after that, right? Just you wait. Okay. Okay. You want just wait. Wait till the teacher ain't here. Wait till the mom ain't here. We're going to come get you. Right? God didn't do you that way. God didn't just save you and then leave you out there vulnerable and exposed for when he's not present. God instead comes to dwell with you and give you life everlasting. Now we're going to come and I ask you uh, to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. So we're going to look at a, a fairly lengthy passage, not really that long. We're going to look at nine verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11 through 20. But I want you to, I want you to write this down. So someone write that in the chat for me. 1 Corinthians 6, 11 through 20, because I want you to get this. I want you to read this. I want you to consider this. Now, I'm not going to mention everything and dive deep into everything in here. There's going to be basically two major things I'm going to pick on out of this verse, but I want you to get the context. And this is what the Bible says. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 11 through 20. And such were some of you. Now, he was talking about sinners. We were sinners in lots of different ways. You can look this up in verse 10. He said, but you were washed, but you were sanctified. In other words, made holy, but you were justified. In other words, just as if you had never sinned in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. Now, then he continues, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Foods for the stomach and the stomach stomach for foods. That's He's quoting what people would say. He said, but God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Why? Because we're God's house. Verse 14, and God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not, or a prostitute. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute, a harlot, is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Verse 18, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So what is Paul doing? Paul is making a case that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And he says, as a result, you need to make every effort to glorify God in your body. You need to make every effort to make sure that how you, how you live your life and what you connect yourself to is all going to be compatible with God. Now, how, how many of y'all have ever watched that show on Netflix called Forged in Fire? Anybody seen that show? If you haven't seen that show, it's a cool show. They're making swords, they're making knives, they're doing all this stuff. And in Forge of Fire, sometimes they have to, basically they have to go, they'll give them like a car and then they got to go to this car and bust off metal pieces and then they got to melt them down and they got to choose the right pieces to make the, to make the weapon or make whatever the object is. Now, sometimes they take metals that aren't compatible. And so when they melt them down, they don't connect or when they try to get together and they start banging on them, they break. They fall apart. Why? Because they're absolutely not compatible. They cannot be mixed into a billet or they can't be shaped into a blade. It's worthless. You have to take that hunk of metal and throw it out. It may look promising. You know, they can't reheat it. And that's one of the most dangerous things. They go in and they reheat it and then they dunk it and then they reheat it and they dunk it pretty soon. You're introducing weakness into that blade and it's going to crack. It's going to break. And this is what Jesus is saying or Paul is saying. It's like if you are trying to mix two things that are completely incompatible, you are not going to have a strong life. And this is what we often do. We often mix lies from the devil or, or desires from the flesh or appeal from the world, the world system, and we try to mix that with God. We try to mix that with Scripture. And what happens is, is we have these two things that do not mix, and we wonder why our life is not strong. We wonder why we break. We wonder why we fall. We wonder why we struggle. Because there are certain things, the incompatibility of sin, and, and Paul in this Scripture is emphasizing sexual immorality. 
He says that's absolutely not compatible with the holy of, uh, holiness of God. Why? Because the Holy Spirit don't want to live in a defiled home. Right? I mean, how many of y'all want to live in a nasty home? Anybody like, like, anybody seen one of those episodes of Hoarders? Like, how would you like to live in that house? I, I, I don't know anybody that would. That's why they call that a psychological disorder. Because it's not normal. Why? Because it's a defilement. It's, 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 it's dirty. It's filthy. And God, the Spirit, does not want to live in my life when my life is disgusting like that. Right? And he said, be careful. And Paul is emphasizing sexual uh, sin here. And I just want to let you guys know that word is pornoneia. And, and porn, pornoneia is the same word where we kind of get the root word for pornography, right? But actually, that word goes all the way back. Porne was, was prostitute. It was buying sex. Uh, in some translations, this may say fornication, which is sex outside of marriage covenant, right? Basically, what he's saying is, is that when we attach ourselves to sexual desire that's not c- attached to covenant, that's when, that's when we get in trouble. That's when we're introducing something into our lives that's going to trip us up and cause us to stumble. So I'm not going to focus on that. I just know that, that as we watch the world and as we look around on what's available, you know, these, these devices here have instant access to pornonea, right? Has instant access to sexual immorality. We all have to guard ourselves. We all have to prepare our, and recognize that the Holy Spirit don't want to live in that mess. God cleanses us from that mess. But I'm going to keep moving because that's not really the emphasis of what we're talking about today. It's when we're filled with the Spirit, we choose to live by the Spirit. And we're now submitted to His influence and leading. And so I want, I want you to look at 1 Corinthians 6, 12 again, but this time I'm going to read it from the message translation. And I think this is so powerful. He says this, Just because something is technically legal doesn't mean that it's spiritually appropriate. If I went, about, went around doing whatever I thought I could get by with, I'd be a slave to my whims. Just because it's technically legal doesn't mean it's spiritually appropriate. And if I do, if I went around doing whatever I thought I could get away with, I'm now a slave to my desires, to my whims. See, staying filled with the Spirit means staying free. I'm no longer a slave to my desire. I no longer come under the power of the flesh. I no no longer fall for the lies of the devil. Being filled with the Spirit means staying free. It means I'm not going to come under the influence or the power of the lies of the devil or the desires of my flesh. So I'm going to start wrapping it up, and I'm going to give you my final major point, and then there's three sub-points, okay? But those are real quick. Number one, or the, the last point, number three, how to be and stay filled. Amen, Gene. I'm going to keep preaching. How to be and stay filled. Next point. So if being filled with the Spirit means living free from the power, influence, and control of the world, the flesh, and the devil, it's important we know how to be filled. Don't you think? And how to stay filled. If I want to live free, if I want to live the life that God has created me for, I want to know how to be filled with the Spirit, and then I want to know how to stay filled with the the Holy Spirit so that way I can maintain this life. In, In that verse we mentioned in Ephesians 5 where it says, be filled with the Holy Spirit, actually the tense of that in the Greek is, Be being filled. It's a constant thing. This is something we want to do every day. So uh, out of the three ways that I'm going to give you on how to be filled and how to stay filled, the first one is really simple. Ask God to fill you. Ask God to fill you. Jesus said that the Father would give the Holy Spirit to anyone who asked. The Father. So that would be His children, right? If He's your Heavenly Father, He will give you the child of God, the Spirit of God, if you ask Him. And when the, when the disciples were waiting for the gift, remember that he told them, wait for the gift, the promise of the Holy Spirit. Uh, in Acts chapter 2, what were they doing? They were praying. They were asking God to move. They were asking God to come. They were saying, oh, Lord, come. And what did God do? God responded by filling them. The Bible tells us in Galatians chapter 3 that God redeems us. Jesus redeems us from the curse. He buys us out of sin and he offers us the blessing of Abraham so that by faith we could receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. So so very simply, you want to be filled with the Spirit of God every day? Ask God for the Holy Spirit and receive it by faith. Amen? Next one, real simple. Submit to God in faith. 
submit to God in faith. So we, so we ask God, and now we submit to God in faith. Romans chapter 6, 12 through 14. I'm going to read this in a New Living Translation. This is what the Bible says. It says, do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God, for you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Sin is no longer your master. I'm going to say that again. Sin is no longer your master, for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. See, when we submit to God in faith, what we're doing is actually saying, God, here's my life, use it. This is not restricted to ministry because a lot of us are like, oh, you know, God, here's my life. And what we're saying is, Lord, use me for ministry. Use me for this thing. And, and the Bible's not saying that, not limiting that to ministry as we say it. The, the, the scripture is encouraging us in all that we do, every single day, offer ourselves to God. And, and it gives us the responsibility to choose who we're going to be filled with, who we're, what influence we're going to come up under. Are you going to come under the, the flesh? Are you going to come under sin? Or are you going to come under the leading of the Holy Spirit? We choose that. We're, choo we're free to choose who we're going to serve. So, so we have to make sure that we're submitting to God our lives so that we can live in the freedom that he gave us. So, so what do we want to do with that? How simple is that? We just stay away from things that aren't glorifying God, right? We walk in the power of the Spirit and we offer ourselves to him moment by moment, day by day. It is very simple. It's, it's not always easy, right? It's a simple principle, but it's not always easy, is it? Because sometimes our flesh be pulling us strong, doesn't it? Sometimes our desires be pulling us. Sometimes that voice in the back of our head that's shouting at us to do this and do that is very loud, isn't it? But we have a choice. I say, I will not do that. I will not participate in that. I will not engage in that. I will not go there. The last one. Last one, set your mind on spiritual things. Set your mind on spiritual things. I love Romans chapter 8 because Romans chapter 8 is all about the life of the Spirit. I'm going to read verses 5 and 6 in the Amplified. And the Bible says this, For those who are according to the flesh and are controlled by its unholy desires, set their minds on and pursue those things which gratify the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit and are controlled by the desires of the Spirit set their minds on and seek those things which gratify the Holy Spirit. Now the mind of the flesh, which is sense and reason without the Holy Spirit, is death. Death that comprises all the miseries arising from sin, both here and hereafter. But the mind of the Holy Spirit is life and soul peace, both now and forever. I love that last one, but the mind of the Holy Spirit is life and soul peace, both now and forever. How awesome is that? See, it's imperative that you curate your thoughts, that you curate your thoughts. The more you watch, uh, uh, listen to, and think about things that don't honor God, the, the more in danger you are of coming under bondage to those things. The more, the more I step away from the things of God, the more I focus on and listen to and watch and, and be a part of those things. I mean, think about it. How many of us have stumbled because of comparisons that we make with someone else on social media? How many of us listen to music that gets us in a mood and that mood is not always a good one? It's not a holy one. How many of us watch shows that we really ought not to watch? That they don't glorify God. They don't bring us closer to God. Instead, what happens is we begin to come under the spirit of those things. See, the more we set our focus on the things of the Spirit, the more life and soul peace we experience. The more life and soul peace we experience. So I want to encourage you because this is probably one of the most critical of all. Because this setting our mind on, on the things of the Spirit leads us into a place where we're in position to open our lives and submit that to God. Every day we want to start our day, Father, please give me more of your Holy Spirit. Please saturate me with your will and your purpose. But then we have to help God move in our lives by focusing our mind on the right stuff. You know, if you know watching that news broadcast is going to get you angry and you're going to come up under a spirit of anger or a spirit of fear, don't watch it. You know, if that, if that stuff is going to pollute your soul or that's going to challenge your mindset, don't watch it. 
Instead, fill your heart with worship. Fill your heart with godly things. Fill your heart with the scriptures. Why? Because your freedom depends on it. Your peace depends on it. Your joy depends on it. See, God wants us to be free. And if we're going to live in the freedom for which Christ set us free, we're going to need to fill our lives with truth and with his Holy Spirit. And this is an ongoing daily process. So, so, so as we wrap things up, and every day I want to challenge you, ask God to fill you afresh. I mean, even now, God, fill me. Fill me, God. Fill me afresh. Then we want to submit ourselves, our schedule, our activities, uh, all those things to the Lord. God, here's, here's my day. I offer it to you. God, you know we got an appointment. I got a meeting. I got a class. I got a Zoom you know, conference call. God, I give that to you. Let your spirit lead me in this situation. Right? Set your mind on spiritual things. Curate what you take in. Be discriminate. Uh, this is trash. This is not good for my soul. This isn't honoring to God. I'm going to cut it out. I'm going to cut it out. I'm going to cut it out until what's left is something that pleases the Lord. Because if I set my mind on those things, I'm going to enjoy peace. I'm going to enjoy life. I want to close in prayer and I want you to just take a moment and, and, and ask the Holy Spirit, what is he saying to you? Just right now, just take a moment right where you are and just ask God what he's saying to you. And I'm going to pray for you. And I'm going to pray for three specific things. I'm going to pray for those that are harassed by the devil right now, that you'd be freed. I'm going to pray for those. I'm actually going to pray for all of us that we receive a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to pray that God will infuse you with a desire to do the other things necessary to fill your house and make it a place where God is pleased to dwell. So, Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you would release through the power of the Holy Spirit every one of us that are hearing, every person that is hearing this word, Lord, loose us from the grip of the enemy. Father, I pray that you deliver us from evil. Lord, yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, yours is the glory. Lord, we command every demonic spirit, every oppressive spirit, every evil thing to be released, to, to be loosed from our lives. And Father, I ask in, in its place, as you cleanse us and purify us, Lord, that you would fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray for a fresh touch from heaven for every person. I pray for soul rest for every person. I pray for the fire of God to come upon every person. Lord, I pray for fresh encounters, for dreams and visions and revelations, for the presence of God and the power of God and the purpose of God to be rekindled alive, to be filling each person's soul. Lord, afresh tonight. And then, Father, I pray that you would encourage all of our faith to partner with you and participate with you to fill our house, to fill our hearts with things that make it a place pleasing to the Spirit of God, a place where you are happy to make your home. Lord, we know that our heart, we know that collectively your church is your favorite house. And Lord, we want to make it welcoming to you. We want to make it inviting to you. So Lord, tonight, I pray that as you free us from the power of the devil, that you fill us afresh with the Holy Spirit and help us to be aggressive in our faith in curating our thought life and presenting ourselves to you and in regularly, consistently asking you in prayer for fresh touches, for fresh infilling. Lord, and I believe that as we'll do those things and we partner with you, you're going to change our lives and cause us to be different people. Lord, as you remodel our lives into your image and your likeness. Lord, let your blessing come upon each person in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.